Welcome to the Understanding How to Access Evidence-Based Services module. This is the second of our video module series designed by a team from the UC Davis Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, also known as the SED, and community partners and parents, specifically to support the individual needs of African American families of children with developmental disabilities in the state of California. My name is Elizabeth Morgan and I work here at the SED, but I'm also a parent of a child with a developmental disability. In the first module, you heard about the process that happens when it comes to acceptance. But in this module, you will learn more about the process of finding and accessing services to support children with developmental disabilities in California. You will also learn about evidence-based practices and tools to use to determine if one of these practices will be appropriate to include into your child's intervention program. This is an account from Dr. Jane Paul, a board-certified behavioral analyst, giving advice on the importance of accessing services for your children with developmental disabilities and the role that parents have in playing and securing those services. So Jane, tell me what advice would you give a parent, a family member, or a caregiver to help them know their power and about the importance of securing the right services for their child? Really, the one thing I can say is be your child's advocate. Know your rights as a parent. If you don't advocate your child, for your child, nobody else will. So do the best you can. Educate yourself. If there are some free seminars, go. Make the time to go. Like even on your, uh, on the, your website, there is so much information. I've seen videos of things that parents can do in their home and it's, look for that information take time to really educate yourself and just find an advocate 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 and be in communication with your providers work with them they are your best resources dr. Jane is right an educated parent is truly an empowered parent one of the things that few people ever explicitly tell parents is that they, after they receive a diagnosis, is that they are now the CEO of their child's intervention program. Now, I'm not saying this to sear you, but I have to be brutally honest and when I say that you are now in charge of managing the success of your child's intervention, which means that you have to be knowledgeable and educated about what good intervention looks like. Now, that does not mean that you have to go back to school and become a professional, but honestly, many of us do. But it does mean that you need to take the time to be able to get informed and empowered about what evidence-based practice and what good intervention looks like. So in order to do that, you must know two things. First is what types of services your child needs. And then second, you need to know how and who to ask for those services. So to answer the first question, I will give you one of the most valuable resources that my family has used. And it's through a project done right here at the UC Davis Mind Institute called the CAPTAIN Project. The CAPTAIN Project is a CDE-funded, multidisciplinary network developed to support the understanding of use of evidence-based practice for individuals affected with autism spectrum disorder. Listen to my colleague, Patty Shetter, discuss exactly what evidence-based practices are and why they're important. So what are these evidence-based practices? Really, all that means is that these practices have some scientific research behind them that's been done really well and by multiple people showing that these practices work to affect some kind of change with a specific population, okay? So we use them because it's in policy that we should. The Individuals with Disability Education Act says you should use research-informed evidence-based practices. There's lots of things out there with no scientific evidence, um, and we don't have time for that, right? We gotta get down to business and get down to helping kids and families, so we wanna know what those um, practices are. On the CAPTAIN website, you will find a helpful tool that looks just like this. This tool takes information derived from the National Professional Development Center that took an extensive review 
of over 175 studies about evidence-based practice to come up with 27 targeted intervention strategies that have been shown to support children with autism and other developmental disabilities ages 0 to 22. This tool can be used to know what exactly the 27 practices are and how to select the right one for your child. On the left, you will see a very brief description of the evidence-based practice. Across the top, you will see the domains that are typically addressed in intervention for individuals on the autism spectrum, but it can be useful to use for individuals with other disabilities. These include social, communication, behavior, joint attention, play, school readiness, academics, motor, adaptive skills, vocational skills, and mental health. Below the domains, you will see the age ranges 0 to 5, 6 to 14, and 15 to 22. Anything highlighted in green has been demonstrated to support children 0 to 5. Anything highlighted in yellow has been demonstrated to support children 6 to 14. And anything that is highlighted in blue has been demonstrated to be effective for children that are in the transition stages, like in high school, from 15 to 22. So I and many other families have used this tool to narrow down the options to suggest for my child's intervention team what I thought might be an appropriate intervention for my child. So before I go to the team, I do my research. I use tools like this to think about what are the concerns that I have for my child at the time, and then I find the domain that the concern falls under, and I think about the age range that my child is in, and I then research the highlighted evidence-based practices and read the descriptions. So once I find the one or two options that I think will work, I go to the Captain website and I pull up the information about evidence-based practice. You can also find many more resources on the UC Davis Mind Institute website and Facebook pages. There are even videos of presentations from the world's leading researchers on developmental disorders archived and as well as quick tip videos that will support knowing more about ideas such as how to help your child transition and adapt to change using such tools as social narratives and first then schedules. We even have another module that you can review called the ADAPT module that will allow you to learn more details about setting up a home intervention plan for your child with ASD. Now, you might be asking yourself, okay, it's great to know that I have all these services and interventions out there, but I'm not really sure how exactly I'm supposed to get these services started. If that's you, trust me, you are not alone. It can be very confusing to know who to talk to and where you're supposed to go to to get these services started. And most of the time, you will have an ongoing relationship with at least two to three different people from different intervention agencies, such as your child's pediatrician and health insurance provider, the regional center, and if your child's over three years old, your home school district. A great tool to use to locate the contact information for each of these agencies can be found in the county-specific resources section of the California Map to Inclusion and Belonging website. The Map to Inclusion and Belonging is funded by the California Department of Education and managed by West Ed Center for Child and Family Services. Its goal is to support the inclusion of children with disabilities ages birth to 22 in childcare, preschool, and after-school community settings. The website provides comprehensive resources supporting children with disabilities that are helpful for families, childcare providers, educators, and other professionals. Okay, I know this is a lot of information and you could feel overwhelmed and there's so many resources, but remember to not let yourself get to a place where you feel like you can't do it. So for the last part of this module, you're gonna hear from families. We have all felt the range of emotions that come with this new role in your child's life. And we can all testify to how important it is that you get the services that are right for your child as early as possible. Now that you know more about your role in accessing services and more resources about how to find evidence-based interventions that are right for your child, let's listen to some families and hear about how accessing services has been helpful for them and their children. So Nakia, can you tell me about how you felt when a therapist first started coming to your home and started working with your daughter? So I was a little bit open to um, any type of resources. I've always been just like any type of anything I could learn about it or apply to her life. So thinking back over the years when your child was first diagnosed, can you tell a little bit of 
how much of a role do you think therapy really played in your family when it came to helping you understand how to support your child? And how have you actually been able to use information that they have given you? Therapy was extremely important for us, especially in the beginning. Just like I said, because I didn't know anything about anything. Like, I was raised in a family where there were a lot of kids. So me just learning to parent along with learning to parent a child, you know, with a disability. I mean, like I said, any type of resource I could find, I was willing to take. So when I came across, like, I mean, I was always open, just whatever, any type of program, class, anything. Like, it's always been, like, even to this day, even with me knowing what I know now and her getting older and maybe not being so severe with it, I'm still just open to whatever I can learn, whatever she can do, any type of class we could take together or whatever, like any type of technique I've been taught on how to deal with her. I, I, we probably, I probably use it probably daily. I try to always be more just calm and you know, whatever comes from her, I'm accepting and I work with and, you know, just because I'm her mom and I've been around her the longest I know, you know, how to handle her and, like, there are times when, you know, she can get, you know, moody or whatever the case may be and, I mean, I've never treated her like she has a disability, like, per se. I've always treat her like a normal kid. Like I know what she's capable of and I know, like there are times where she'll try to act like she don't know something or just to get out of stuff and I know. So I mean, just things I've learned from the classes and stuff, I, I just, I make sure not to like treat her any different. So Sophia, can you tell me a little bit about some of the apprehensions that you had when you first started services for your daughter? And then I want you to think about ways that having various services such as behavioral services or respite services have really empowered you to be your child's best advocate. So in the beginning of therapy, I went in it not wanting certain things. Like I didn't like the idea of rewarding her with food, you know, if she did something. So I was kind of apprehensive towards that. And then parent training, you know, like they want you to do parent training. And I was like, why would I need to do parent training? But when I did quit work, I was more available, I was more um, open to these things, and I was actually present. And so um, parent training taught me a lot because she has, um, a, she wants to eat, you know, she wants to eat chips if she could, and then she started getting sick. So at that moment, I had to take some things that I learned from parent training, and you can't have what you really want until you have this apple, you have to eat it all. And I had a lot of time now because I wasn't working. And I just waited it out. And um, that was another thing that helped. And then we had a therapist who came to our house. And the therapist picked up right away. She was like, she doesn't really know how to wait. We're going to have to do some waiting lessons. And then um, we started the waiting lessons, just short ones, you know, five minutes at a time. She would have to wait to do something. And then we were able to increase it. And then, um, so that helped. And then we're a very active family. And I was like, well, she needs to know safety on the street. And so now I started incorporating some of my ideas, how we can help her. We did red light, green light, you know. Um, we, as, we took it as far as having a red light, green light on the iPad. And we did it in the office, then we did it outside. And then we, I always was on the street with her, showing her, but I had to figure out, is this really gonna work? So I had to be comfortable enough to step back and see if she would stop at a stoplight, and she did. So um, those type of things um, made it easier for me to let a respite worker that I don't know into my home. I know my daughter can shower herself, she can get dressed, she can request for food. I can give the therapist, I mean the, the respite worker tools to help her where we don't have to worry about, you know, serious behaviors. I can personally understand how difficult it can be to allow new people into your child's life and into your home, especially if you're anything like my family who considers ourselves pretty private people. But listen to both Jerome and James' accounts of how getting past these awkward feelings and allowing themselves to partner with their interventionists has really helped their loved ones. 
the beginning, you know, you have you have an ABA or you have a different program, whether it's in your home or, or at, a, at, a, at an agency. Uh, at first, it's kind of awkward, you know, because you don't know people, and, and sometimes you have people coming into your home, and you're kind of like, okay, when are they leaving? You know, you just, um, but after a while, when you start getting used to people, and people start getting familiar with you, and, and you see the good work that they're doing, in a sense, they do become like family that is supporting you. Um, and so I think that it, it is a process. And then, of course, you know, if you lose someone that has developed that relationship, you also feel that the loss of that, that connection, and then you got to start all over again. Um, but I think it's just a matter of just going through that adjustment, maintaining, and being able to work through it. Yeah, there's been a lot of people who have um, come into our lives because of Christopher, and a lot of those people we actually didn't want. We didn't want them to leave, but they had to do it because of um, job complications or maybe just he was aging out of something. But uh, again, we've also had people, we've had a fair share of people that weren't necessarily bad, but like weren't exact weren't what we needed at the time. So some people have been um, speech therapists who um, I think, I want to say my mom is still in contact with today. Um, if there's ever like a big event happening for Christopher, as far as like um, academics, um, she'll always try to invite those people. There is his old occupational therapist who She also, she would bring me into appointments too, just to kind of like watch, like be around Christopher. Um, she had me watch what she would do, and then say, okay, you don't need to incorporate this necessarily at home. I want you to know exactly how this works. I will also have you listen to disability advocate, Lisa Cooley, tell about the importance of accessing services and how those services can lead to a better life for your child now and long-term. So Lisa, what do you think parents need to know about accessing services for their child? So always, no matter what the professionals say, work, work with them, but also remember that, she, that you and the professionals are part of a team and that you bring a perspective to the team that no one else does, no matter what professionals you come across. And, if, and even if the different professionals tell you, no, we can't do five or seven or 10 different things, always know that even though they say no, there is a, there is a way to work with different professionals and organizations to, to get what you need, despite of hearing no time after time after time what seems like time after time after time, and never give up on yourself or your child or your children. Because that's the way they can have the most independent future they can possibly have. So Lisa, what do you tell parents who think that they do not need a diagnosis for their child? And why do you think that a label is so important? Because the diagnosis, at least medically, determines what kind of future a person with a developmental disability could have. In California, it's a, way to, it's a way to get access to all kinds of services depending on your disability or disabilities. And I'd like for you to say, how do you think that a parent can be powerful in making a change for their child? For parents, it's important to get the most accurate diagnosis you can get, and if you don't understand a diagnosis, go to as many people as possible and get the diagnosis of your son or daughter or grandson or niece or nephew in the most understandable language you can possibly get because like I said before, that diagnosis or diagnoses could in a small way determine what kind of future your family member will have. As we wrap up this second module, I will leave you with two pearls of wisdom that I hope will give you comfort. The first is a quote that is widely used in the disability parent community, but recently restated by actress and mother of son on the autism spectrum, Holly Robinson Pete. It states, what I have also come to understand about my role as an advocate for my child, that accessing the right services and intervention to help him is not about me trying to change him or making him a different person, but it's about helping him to be the very best person he can be 
and finding the services that will help him unlock his greatest potential. I will end this module with words of advice for my husband, Jerome, about giving parents who are just getting a diagnosis for their children. As you listen to this, remember that you are your child's best advocate and you will not always know what to do, but with the supports and knowledge, you have everything you need. Like I said, you have a community of people out there here to support you. You got this. It's gonna be a process that um, they're gonna be bumps in the road, but at the same time, uh, as you stick in there, you're gonna see success, you're gonna see, you're gonna see progress. Um, in those times when you do feel hopeless, when you feel like giving up, when you feel like it's all your fault, to just know that this is it's a common feeling, that it's normal to feel that way, and at the same time know that it, you know it's it's not your fault. It's just it's a situation, neurological, some things are just out of our control. And now just make you just do what you need to do now to move forward. And I think again, getting the education is so important. Um, being able to reach out to those who can understand is so important. And being able to um, certainly do what you need for yourself, you know, you know, exercising, you know, praying, um, watching football, that's what I do, you know, finding things that you love to do to, to re-energize yourself, but don't lose sight of um, the, the purpose of what you need to be doing for your family. And um, just hang in there, stick in there, you know, it's going to work out, it's going to work out, don't give up.